Hello everyone, hope you're all doing great. I just wanted to say, if you struggle with mental health issues, make sure that you plan out things and have a goal and general direction in life. It doesn't matter if it changes necessarily, but make sure you always have something bigger that you're working on, because for me, there's nothing worse than having too much time to think and no direction. If I have a goal, then I stay happy, so I thought I'd share that and hopefully it can help someone. So anyway, enjoy these stories and make sure you check out my Instagram at Joe the Insomniac and the podcast in the description. About a year ago, I was living with my mate. I stayed in a ground floor flat that kind of sits in a clue de sac and is a bit of a pain to walk to, kind of detached from the community. The only times I felt completely secure are during sunlight depending on the time of year. The block of flats sits kind of in an L shape. Our entrance sits kind of on the side of a 90 degree angle. Inside the main building, there's a flat either side and stairs in front. The immediate entrance to the hall is very dark. It really feels like the lights choose when not to work. The flats are very basic. A hallway, two small double doors, a bathroom, decent living room and a small kitchen. The hallway is quite long and the living room is at the end of it. Both bedrooms face each other so we can walk from our doorways, if that makes sense. Now we live near a forest and it's about 11 slash 11.30 at night and my flatmate was in her room, presumably asleep. She had a habit of leaving things unlocked and I had to make sure everything is locked up before I head off to sleep, but she got in better and normally at least had the chain on the door. If it wasn't locked, she always goes to bed early so it's weird. I was in the living room and decided to grab a pint of water before heading to bed myself. I went into the kitchen, which is attached into the living room, switching on the kitchen light and filling up a glass. The car park in front of the flat is also very dark. I remembered feeling eerie, I don't know why, I just sometimes get a feeling that something is off, kind of like the feeling that I'm being watched. Anyway, I had a couple of sips and fill the glass a little more and head to go back out the kitchen when the front doorbell went. I froze. I didn't even know we had a doorbell. About 10 seconds passed before the letterbox was hit twice and my stomach sank. I felt trapped in the kitchen. Now some important notes, if you step out of the kitchen, it puts you into the perfect line with the hallway, that's if the living room doors are open, which it was, too. Our front door had a bloody window so you can see the silhouettes of anyone outside or in. I grabbed my phone and called my mate who was in her room, right next to the front door. We both whispered to each other, did you hear that? Both thinking we've misheard it. We had to whisper because the walls are like paper in the flat, so you can always hear people coming and going. She come to the bedroom doorway but couldn't go forward because then she'd be in direct sight of the window. I edged my way out of the kitchen, keeping flat against the wall, eventually sinking to the floor, texting her now because we're both close to the door and they can hear us. Another thing you should probably know is that this person must have been buzzing on other flats trying to get in the building, but didn't buzz ours, so I reckon they saw me in the kitchen window. I'm a pretty ordinary looking 120 pound girl. Lying in my kind of army crawl, I saw the silhouette of a tall, broad, bald man. It could only have been a man. He chapped the letterbox again, but just stood there. Terrified, I mouthed to my friend, did you lock the door? And she said no, the chain wasn't on either. Now or never, I supposed. I crawl as low as I can to the bedroom, crawl to the desk, grab my keys, crawl to the door, it's only about a metre, and frantically shove the keys in and twist it, at the same time as putting the chain on. This is noisy, he obviously noticed. Hitting the letterbox again, trying the handle as desperately as he could. Terrified to stand up, my mate put her head out of the room to see if we were cool and he wasn't there anymore. 
I'm kind of half stoned, half asleep, and she reckoned just to go back to bed. Something nagged me though really bad. Remember how I said we could hear people coming and going really easily? Well, it was eerily quiet and not once did either of us hear the building to the main door open or close. This was someone in the building. We had one person across from us, two above us, two above them. Two of the flats are students and Ava's across was a 90 year old woman. There were a couple of short long haired chill guys. Nobody we knew matches the description. I stayed up until I couldn't anymore texting mates, jamming my room door shut, getting the hockey stick near me. I realised about a month after this that the service button to the front of the main building was actually broken and anybody could come in if they pressed it hard enough. I still think they saw me in the kitchen and decided to try their luck. This could have easily been a complete different story. Make sure you always lock your doors and double check no matter how safe your area is. We literally have no idea to this day who that was or what they wanted. I'm just glad they didn't get in. So over the summer, I was at Oregon Country Fair getting ready to head out of the camp with my boyfriend. We were packing up our car, 10 on top of the FJ Cruiser, and I went up to the tent to start throwing out our things to pack up. The metal ladder's slippery, and had no tape grip on it, and I was wearing socks. While climbing out of the tent, I fell 7 feet straight onto my head. My boyfriend dropped everything rushing to me asking if I'm okay. I said I'm fine, just my head hurts. Of course my recollection of this is very blurred. He told me sit down in the car, and I was getting upset that he wasn't letting me get up and help him pack. I guess out of annoyance, I got out of the car and my legs apparently collapsed. He calls the paramedics immediately as I start to slip into complete blackness. I don't remember much else, which is where the real story begins. I'm in the ambulance and I can hear sirens. I feel oxygen in my nose. I hear the EMT yelling my name but I can't reply, open my eyes or move. Every second I slip deeper and deeper into what I can only explain as darkness. It sounds silly but this feeling and sensation is indescribable unlike anything else I've ever experienced in my life. The EMT is helping me starting to push incredibly hard with his fingers into my sternum, which brings me back. Each press causes pain. I open my eyes and I hear the EMT say, only responds to painful stimuli, and then I was out again. The next thing I remember is feeling my clothes being cut off me when I get to hospital. I apparently then started to have seizures and convulsions due to lack of oxygen to my brain as I go further and further away from the world. They had to insert a ventilator into me because I was struggling to breathe. My boyfriend was obviously in shambles. The doctors actually said to him that they're not sure if I'm going to have permanent brain damage or not. Now, when entering the ICU, I remembered being stranded in the blackness, floating and wandering, waiting. I wasn't sure what I was waiting for what I was doing in the first place. I have no idea what's happening. I saw nothing and felt nothing. I was nothing. I didn't know who I was, what had happened, or where the hell I was. I remembered it feeling like floating through endless space, but the thing is, there was an overwhelming sense of calmness through this, so I wasn't scared. After almost 24 hours, I start slowly coming back and break consciousness at certain moments of my coma. Eventually, the most beautiful thing happened. I won't forget it for the rest of my life. My boyfriend was finally let into the ICU to see me after all this madness that was happening. Thinking I was completely gone, he says to a nurse if he can hold my hand and she says yeah, be careful because you don't want to move too much because of the tubes in her throat. At that moment, when he's approaching, I slowly start to open my eyes. I remember wondering, I think it's purgatory. All I could think about was my boyfriend. 
I didn't know who Aaron was, or what Aaron was, but the idea of him gave me some warmth. A reason to find my place back. Aaron told me before I had slightly opened my eyes, I start to reach out for him while my eyes are closed. He holds my hand and then my eyes open slightly and I eventually came back. Obviously I'm fine now and exit whatever place I was in. I've always thought that it's weird when you die and I've heard there's traces of DMT found in your brain. Now this is nothing like that. There was no sign of that in this place. There were no vibrant and beautiful colours. There's no contact with special or beautiful creatures, and no sense of completion in the next realm. It made me wonder if there's life after death, and if there's really a place that I went to, like purgatory. That's the only way I can describe where I went, really. This happened to me in a group of friends, in the fall of 2005. We're really into checking out old abandoned buildings and such. Well, being this is pretty illegal, we often did it at night so hopefully we don't get caught. One night, we decided to check out this old abandoned high school that I read about online. The school actually partially burned down in 1926, and then another was rebuilt only to suffer a fire in 1955. The school closes its doors after this, and we're super amped to go and check it out, and it's a two hour drive away. So we drive up this tiny curvy road up a large hill. The school is against a wooded backdrop, and creates an ominous feel. The whole place was just dark and eerie. I snapped a picture of it on my phone, but the picture's awful because of the dark. Strangely, there's all kinds of floating spots and orbs in it. Throughout the night, we're all taking photos on our phones, and some of them have more orbs on it. I even took a disposable camera. Now the night was fairly uneventful, now we walk through the school and walk the grounds. Nothing jumped out at us, no creaks or moaning, just a creepy vibe. The odd event is when we're standing in the stairwell of the school, I pulled out a cigarette and went to light it with my lighter, and my lighter doesn't work. No big deal. We all smoke and there's four of us. My friend took out his lighter to light it for me. It doesn't work either. Probably a coincidence. Both of our other friends take theirs out and they don't work. Now, they worked perfectly fine before this. After we left the place pretty bummed out and nothing happened, my friend goes to light a cigarette and it works perfectly fine. All the rest of us go to do the same and, you know what, they all work fine. I really can't explain what happened there. If I didn't know the backstory to the place I wouldn't be so scared but knowing that it's a place that burnt down and we couldn't light our cigarettes terrifies me. I want to tell you about an experience me and my brother shared about two years ago. So, we were deciding to go somewhere haunted during the day. There's a cemetery in Santa Cruz we decide to check out. We go in and walk around and find nothing out of the ordinary and decide to leave. The cemetery is on a supposed haunted road that leads off into the woods. The road is said to be haunted by a lady in white that tries to hitchhike into your car. I've forgotten about that fact until after the day. Okay, so along this road, we're driving down, it leads into a forest area, a couple of miles down from the cemetery where you can pull into the side of the road and walk along the hiking trail. So we decide to hike this trail because I completely forgot the road was also haunted, so I wasn't even looking for the paranormal. Anyway, we start hiking this trail in the afternoon. Ten minutes into the trail, we stumble along an abandoned train track and barely stand in bridge that the train used to use. It looks cool, so we decide to go down the hill right by the bridge that lets you go under the dilapidated bridge. 
We go under there and just mess around, looking at the cool architecture. After we had our view, we start backing up to the little hill that leads into the trail. When we get to the top, we're a little exhausted because the hill is kind of steep and you have to use trees around you to climb up. So as we're standing around back on the trail, we both notice something out of the ordinary. We can hear a voice. Now, like a grown man shouting and screaming angrily. When I say angry, I mean mad. Like, murderous. We quiet down, and I can tell the voice is very far away, almost sounding like it was in the mountains around us. Sounding more than 500 feet away for sure, and we look at each other like the hell. We stand around listening for 15 seconds, and the next thing you know, the voice came down the trail from what sounded like hundreds of feet away to being right next to us down the trail. The inhuman speed of the voice come closer to us, and it's very unnatural. I notice the voice coming from down the trail and thinking to myself that it sounds like somebody's about to kill someone out of rage. But the weird thing is that the voice is speaking in what I can only call gibberish. I understood not one word of it. I instantly get this fight or flight feeling in my body because the voice starts getting very loud and closer to us at inhuman speeds. I tell my brother to pick up some huge sticks with me to defend ourselves because even though the voice came out of the middle of nowhere and moved down the trail at lightning speeds, I still had the assumption that it's some kind of crazy person trying to kill someone. We pick up the sticks and run down the trail back to the car. Now here's the weirdest part. As we're running away from this voice that's coming down the other end of the trail, I hear the voice come up behind us in an instant. It sounded like he was no more than 10 feet behind us chasing us back to the car. I turn around, even though I don't want to, because I have to see who the psycho is. As I turn back, I hear the voice right behind me, and I see no one. I tell my brother to run faster because the voice is right behind us yelling in absolute rage, but I see nobody chasing us. We start picking up the speed and the craziest thing in my life happened. The voice starts panning around us completely. I hear the man yelling gibberish right behind me, then from my left ear to right. Then, the voice is right in front of us, and it slides to the right hand side of the trail. Within 10 seconds, it's in front of us again. Now we're very creeped out, running the rest of the trail back to the car, and that voice kept following us down the trail. I remembered after hearing the voice panning around us and hearing it reverberate through the trees, I start desperately praying to Jesus Christ to help us get out of there alive. After we make it around halfway down the trail to my car, the voice vanishes. I remembered slowing down exhausted as we talk about what we just heard. I asked my brother if he heard the voice slide in circles and he did too. At that point, I know I'm not hallucinating or imagining it. He too describes it as somebody yelling like they're about to murder someone. We speed out of there in a heartbeat, and I remember driving in silence. That's when I remembered that the road is meant to be haunted and not just a cemetery. I've been down that trail alone a few months before this experience and never had anything weird like this happen. It's one of the strangest things I've ever experienced in my entire life. To this day, I've never been back down the road, and never plan on it again. Everything I've written down is in absolute truth and not altered. The Santa Cruz area and mountains are known for cults and very dark magic being performed there. So it was in a convention in my city, and I was waiting for two friends of mine to arrive. It's not the biggest convention, but nothing was very small to be said. There's a lot of sponsoring, a lot of people, and a lot of loud noises and colours. I'm sitting at the entrance, in a spot where you can't really be seen by anyone. Now, after about 15 or 20 minutes of waiting, I grab a smoke and just chill, thinking it couldn't take any longer for them to arrive. From my left side, 
three men walked towards me, one looking me straight in the eyes. At this point, my alarms were already ringing in my head. I thought that maybe he just wanted to ask me for a cigarette, as I'm never the kind of guy who doesn't share a smoke with strangers. Two of them were staring directly at me, and one said, hey, little girl, you got some change? said the one next to me, and I'm a 24 year old male, but by not growing out any of my facial hair, having long hair, I can be mistaken for the other gender. I was like, sorry, I've got nothing on me, which was the truth since I never had any money on me, only card. They then said, show me your wallet. I don't believe you, in an aggressive tone. Things are getting real now. I prepare my mind for the worst. I say, no, sorry, I can't do that. I can spare you a cigarette, but I'm not showing you my wallet. He agreed and said, do I have free smokes? I thought for him and his friends. As I was searching my pocket, he pulled out something, slowly getting towards me. Quite lucky, but I turned my head to him and saw a freaking needle which he tried to move towards me slowly. I'm gonna use this girl, you're gonna change your mind. I literally jumped up out of the bench, pushing the two dudes away from me. Maybe they were surprised that I was able to move so quick, and it made it alright to get away. No, if I'm not doing that, was the last thing I screamed at them as I ran away. I walk to the convention line very quickly. I bump into the security guard and tell him exactly what happened. He looked at me angrily, jumped over the barrier and said I'm gonna kill them, before he sprinted away into their direction. This happened to me a year ago and I still don't know what happened to them.